Okay, good morning and welcome to the 2011 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. Jennifer Newbury. Jen is a postdoctoral researcher and an instructor at the University of Alberta. Jen received her bachelor's degree in wildlife biology at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. She stayed at the University of Wisconsin to pursue her master's degree in natural resources, where she studied the effects of lake characteristics on, and human disturbance on habitat selection by fish-eating birds. Subsequently, Jen moved to the North Dakota State University in Fargo to pursue her PhD in zoology. For her dissertation, she studied aspects of reproduction in yellow-headed blackbirds. Upon completing her PhD, Jen moved to Alberta to hold a postdoc and instructor position at the University of Alberta, a position she has held for the past four years. Recently, Jen has accepted a faculty position in the Department of Biology at Columbus State University in Georgia, a position she will start in the next few weeks, actually. Uh, today, Jen will be presenting the results of her research on blackbird reproduction in a talk entitled Carotenoid Pigments and Reproduction in Wetland-Dependent Birds. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Jennifer Newbury. Thanks for the introduction, Francois. So today I'm going to be talking about these two different species of wetland-dependent blackbirds. Um, so one that I'm going to spend most of the time talking about is this one here, and that's the yellow-headed blackbird, these are both females. And then I'm going to move on and talk to you about my research here in Alberta where I'm going to, I've been working on the red-winged blackbird. So this is an outline of how my seminar is organized. I'm going to introduce you to what carotenoids are and then tell you a little bit about yellow-headed blackbirds because they have some unique things about their biology that makes them a very interesting study species. Then I'm going to go through three different publications or research projects that I've worked on, uh, mainly in North Dakota. And then I'm going to wrap up the seminar talking to you about my current research that I'm doing here in Alberta on the red-winged blackbird. So what are carotenoids? Carotenoids are biologically active yellow, red, and orange pigments that are synthesized by plants and photosynthetic microorganisms. And because birds and other organisms like ourselves cannot create carotenoids for ourselves, we obtain them all from our diet. And they carry out a lot of different functions for us, as well as birds, in, and in plants. So in plants, they're important accessory pigments for photosynthesis. And they also contribute to photoprotection, so to protect the cells of the plants from damage from UV light. In animals, they're very important antioxidants, so they help us to combat cancer, as well as they help to stimulate our immune system. And they are also very important precursors to vitamin A. As well as having these various uh, biological functions, the carotenoids are also used quite extensively by organisms for the bright coloration that we see. So all of the bright red that you see in these different groups of organisms here are produced by carotenoids. So the red fin coloration in this guppy, the red exoskeleton coloration in these aphids, as well as the exoskeleton of this cherry shrimp, and then the beautiful coloration that we see in birds like this bright red coloration in this male northern cardinal. So although we've only found or described uh, less than 10 carotenoids in avian diets, again, because they're getting these only from their food, we found over 40 carotenoids from their tissues. And this is because birds can actually alter carotenoids during digestion, and they can create new ones that are actually quite challenging for us as researchers to describe. So when birds are found, these carotenoid pigments are found in very high concentrations in the skin, as well as in the feathers. Um, the adipose tissue is a great storage site for carotenoids as well as an egg yolk, which I spent a lot of my research studying the role of carotenoid pigments in the egg yolk as well as feathers. So if we look at these examples here, the bright orange coloration in this Egyptian vulture, this coloration is created by carotenoid pigments, and this species actually gets these carotenoids from eating the dung of ungulates. Um, then you can see in this um, American goldfinch that bright yellow coloration in its feathers are carotenoid-based, as well as the orange coloration in its bill and in its legs. So, uh, and then the carotenoids in the, the yolks are very important for that developing embryo. So carotenoids are limited in nature, and therefore it's thought that when a bird or other organism uses carotenoids for sexual signals, that they're actually very honest signals. So this male um, house finch that you see here that has that bright red coloration, likely he is either genetically superior to the more dull one here, 
or he's better able to find food resources that are rich in carotenoids, or he might just be in better health, and therefore he can allocate more carotenoids to his plumage. And so then a female bird can assess these two males and say, hey, he's a lot more sexy because he's so much more red, I'm gonna pick him over the dull guy. But what's really interesting is this is also true to some extent in humans. So when you're looking at these two faces of the same woman, which face do you think is more attractive? Which skin tone do you prefer? The one on the right or the one on the left? The right. And what is it about that face on the right that makes it a bit more attractive? It looks a little bit warmer, looks a little bit more yellow. And actually, if you look at these two images, this woman uh, on the left there, that's her normal skin tone. And the one on the right is after she was on a carotenoid-rich diet supplemented with beta carotene for six weeks. And so basically, when they did a comparison study, they found that in, in the laboratory that when they asked people to rate faces that were either uh, natural coloration, had carotenoid-enriched diets, or were sunburned or suntanned, people actually preferred that carotenoid glow over other faces. So basically, not only are carotenoids important for our immunity and for our antioxidant and, and anti-cancer abilities, but also they're important for making us look more attractive to the opposite sex. So basically, eat more carotenoids for your health and for your attractiveness. Okay, so let's move on now and look at carotenoids in the egg yolk. So they do help to protect the developing embryo. So if you think of an egg, it's a sealed system. It does have some gas exchange, but that little embryo is developing very rapidly. And because it's developing so rapidly, it has a very high metabolic rate and it's producing a lot of byproducts. And what carotenoids do is they help to bind up those byproducts so they don't damage the DNA, the proteins, and the lipids that are very important for that embryo to develop. And actually, the allocation of carotenoids to the egg can have lasting effects. So it's not just during that development stage, but even after hatching, the levels that it experiences in the egg are very important. So for example, in two different species, the lesser blackback gull, they did studies where they found that chicks that hatch from eggs with higher concentrations of carotenoids tended to survive, especially immediately post-hatching, when those chicks are really vulnerable. Um, as well as in the blue tit, which is a species in Europe very similar to our chickadee, uh, they found that chicks that hatch from eggs with higher concentrations of carotenoids tended to be larger, and they also tended to have a faster developing immune system, giving them an advantage, a survival advantage, over chicks that hatch from eggs with lower concentrations. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on and talk to you about the yellow-headed blackbird, now with that brief introduction to carotenoids. So um, as you can see from this breeding bird survey information, uh, the yellow-headed blackbird breeds in very high concentrations throughout the, the Midwest up into Canada. Um, and you can see where the study species was, was in uh, central North Dakota. If any of you have ever been there, this is near Cleveland, North Dakota, a very small town. Um, and as you can see by that bright or that really dark red here, that is the area in North America that has the highest concentrations of this species. So great species to study in North Dakota because they're found in such high concentrations. Okay, so here we're looking at some interesting characters of the yellow-headed blackbird. So they are large passerines, which is the family uh, that we commonly call the songbirds. Um, and they are unique in that they're colonial in their nesting and they're polygynous, meaning that a male will have a harem of females if he's lucky. So if he's on a really poor quality territory, most likely he'll only be able to attract one or two females. But if he's on a really high quality territory, he might be able to attract as many as six. They are um, highly dimorphic in size. So you can see here the male, he's typically around 100 grams and he's very flashy in his coloration. He's got that bright yellow head and breast and a very dark black body with white wing bars. Whereas the female, she's a bit more subdued in her plumage and she's only around 60 grams, so she's almost a little more than half the, or a little less than half the size uh, of a male. Um, and you can see that she's got that yellow coloration, but it's a lot more uh, subdued, it's a little bit smaller, and she's brown overall instead of being black. So they do nest in prairie wetlands. So here you can see a, a nest suspended in cattails and they're always over water. Um, and they do build open cup nests and they are determinate layers, meaning they always lay a clutch of four eggs. Although there's a little bit of variation around that, either three or five. So very unique species in that they're highly dimorphic, have this polygynous mating system, making them very unique for study. So yellow-headed blackbirds, like a lot of our passerines or songbirds, begin incubating their eggs before they finish laying all of their eggs of their clutch. And what happens because of this 
is that the eggs hatch at different times. So the first egg might hatch a day or two ahead of that last hatched egg. And so what happens is there's actually a size hierarchy that develops among those of those nestlings. So you have really small ones because they're hatching last compared to ones that are quite a bit larger. And this does create a size hierarchy, which then results in a survival hierarchy. So that if you're last hatched, you're less likely to survive in that nest than your earlier hatched siblings. And it's thought that female birds can adjust the allocation of resources to their eggs to then better adjust these survival probabilities by either allocating more to number four so that you can increase his chances of surviving or allocate everything to number one because he's most likely to survive anyway. So that leads me into my first research paper that I'm going to talk to you about today. And that's where I studied the laying sequence variation in carotenoid concentrations across the laying sequence. So comparing egg number one with two, three, and four in that laying sequence. So there has been some previous research on looking at the uh, interclutch variation in carotenoid concentrations. So in captive zebra finches, they did find that females would allocate the most carotenoids to last hatched eggs. And that was correlated with an increased probability that that last hatched chick would survive. But in contrast, all the other species studied previously, including the lesser black bag gull, the barn swallow, and the great tit, as well as eight introduced species in New Zealand, they all allocate the most carotenoids to their first laid eggs and then lesser amounts to later laid eggs. And it, what, what's really thought to cause this decrease across the laying sequence is the fact that, again, carotenoids are limited in nature. And so what they think is that females are, they have some resources, some carotenoid resources that they've stored in their adipose tissue. And what's happening is that they're depleting their carotenoid stores as they're laying more eggs. And certainly this has been supported in captive studies uh, where if you feed a female bird more carotenoids, so feed her a carotenoid enriched diet, she will allocate more carotenoids to her eggs. So if she has it available, she's going to give it to her offspring if she can. Okay, so then based on this, looking at the interclutch variation that I expected to find in the yellow-headed blackbird, I did expect that I'd find more carotenoids in the earlier laid eggs than later laid eggs. And this is largely based, again, on the biology of the species, that they start incubation and have asynchronous hatching, and the fact that in this species, the last hatched chick will only survive if an earlier hatched chick dies. So why would a female bird allocate a lot of resources into an offspring who's most likely not going to survive anyway? Okay, so I collected 24 full clutches of eggs in the summer of 2004 and 5. And these were all collected from five different free living breeding colonies, um, 13 nests in 2004 and 11 nests in 2005 for a total of 87 eggs. So each egg was collected on the day it was laid, which means I had to monitor these nests very closely. And that was because if you let an egg start to develop, the embryo starts to utilize them and it can cause some variation that would add extra noise in your data. So it's really important to get a fresh egg. And in order to ensure that the female would complete her clutch instead of coming back to her nest and saying, oh my goodness, my eggs are gone and I have an empty nest, I'm just gonna leave. Uh, what I would do is I would take an egg from a non-study nest and I put it into her nest and she readily accepted it. Um, and so I did this just to ensure that she would continue to lay all of her eggs of her clutch. And I did return the egg to the original nest at the end of the breeding season or at the end of collecting the eggs because I just didn't feel it was right to let that poor female who I had stolen all her eggs from rear somebody else's offspring. So I gave it back to the original mom. So then in the lab, I brought the eggs back into the laboratory and I separated the yolks from the shell and albumin. Um, and it's a really cool way. It's not as easy to do with a chicken egg, but you can try this at home because it's kind of fun, but I'm an egg nerd. Um, you can actually freeze an egg and then it's really easy to peel off the shell if you let it thaw for just a few minutes. And then the albumin, which is the egg white, is very high in water content. So it kind of creates kind of a slushy material on freezing. So you can actually scrape away the albumin and have that really solid, lipid-rich yolk that's remaining. And it stays frozen quite a bit longer. So it's a really easy way to separate out the yolk from the rest of the egg by using this differential freezing rate. So then I got the egg separated, uh, got out the, the yolk. And then I homogenized all of my yolk samples because if you look at a bird egg, um, and again, you can try this at home, it's not quite as clear as the diagrams, but birds do lay down yolk in layers. And you can actually tell how long it takes a bird to yolk up counting these layers. So the white tends to be laid down during the night and the darker coloration, darker yolk is laid down during the day when she's more active. So in order to eliminate that variation across layers, I homogenized the yolk. Um, then I took a small subsample 
And then because these yolks do vary quite a bit in water content, depending on the female, I did freeze dry them all prior to extraction just to make sure there wasn't that added variation because of water. So then I extracted the carotenoids from those samples using some solvents. I quantified them using HPLC, which is simply high performance lip grid chromatography. That's about all you need to know because it's actually fairly straightforward and I'll walk you through it. But this is the old system uh, that I was using, uh, very uh, ancient, probably older than myself, but it got some very reliable results. And then carotenoids absorb most strongly at 450 nanometers, so that was the wavelength that I used. And then in order to identify what was in these yolks, I used pure standards that I obtained from different suppliers. So I did have that as a comparison. Okay, so this is the type of output you get from an HPLC. And this is just looking at the individual carotenoids that I found in yellow-headed blackbirds. So you can see there were four different carotenoids, uh, beta-carotene, beta-cryptoxanthin. Astaxanthin was actually the carotenoid that I put into each of my samples because if I put a known amount of a carotenoid in those samples, it made it easier for me to determine how much of these other carotenoids were present. So this one was actually added on purpose. Then I had lutein and zeaxanthin as well. Okay, so now we're looking at the results. This is looking at concentrations of the carotenoids in the yolk, uh, looking at the different eggs in the laying sequence, so eggs one through four. Um, this is looking at the different carotenoids and then the combined carotenoids. And the eggs within the laying sequence that had the highest concentration of each of these carotenoids um, are highlighted in, in orange. And something of interest to point out here is that uh, these birds had high concentrations of beta-carotene to beta-cryptoxanthin, and this is the exact opposite of all other species that have previously been studied. All other species have highest concentrations of lutein followed by zeaxanthin. So one thing of interest here, too, is that this is the first report of a, the carotenoid content of a bird here in North America. All the birds I can compare this to, this work was done um, in Europe. So uh, it's kind of hard to do that comparison, but kind of unique that we can see this continental difference comparing these North American birds with all other birds previously studied. So you'll notice that there's a lot of orange in this last column here, which is exactly opposite of what I expected. I expected that we'd see uh, the most orange or the highest concentration of all these carotenoids in that first egg, uh, in that first column. So here we're looking at, just looking at some uh, results of some of the statistics I ran. Again, we're having here the egg number, and then the, we're looking here at combined carotenoids. And the eggs with the same letter designation were not statistically distinguishable from one another. So you'll notice here that eggs one and two had lower concentrations of carotenoids than eggs three and four. Again, totally opposite of what I expected. Here I've broken each of the carotenoids individually, uh, broken them down and, and created a graph of each of these. Um, you'll see that three of the four carotenoids, um, beta-carotene, beta-cryptoxanthin, uh, and zeaxanthin, also showed that interclutch increase, whereas the, uh, the lutein uh, was the only one that did follow through with my prediction and decrease across that laying sequence. And remember, I based this on the carotenoid limitation hypothesis and the biology of the species. So kind of interesting and a bit confusing that I found this different trend between that one individual carotenoid and the other three. So then just to try to explain why I might have found these results, really it could be due to three different reasons. It could be due to differences in availability of these different carotenoid pigments in the diet of these birds. It could be due to differences in absorption in the intestine. And it could be due to differences in antioxidant function. So it might simply be a, an adaptive reason that I found these trends. So first of all, looking at availability, certainly what would you expect here? Well, what I would expect would be that lutein is more limited in the diet. And that again, a female is running out of lutein as she's laying her eggs. Whereas beta-carotene, maybe it's more readily available. And she can just allocate as much as she wants to number four instead of running out uh, like she is with lutein. But definitely requires more research. It could also be due to differences in absorption. So carotenoids do interact with one another during absorption in our intestine and in the intestine of birds. And polarity does play a role in this. So the more polar the carotenoid, uh, it can block the absorption of a nonpolar carotenoid. And they found that in studies on birds, and they found a positive relationship between the polarity of a carotenoid molecule and the tissue concentrations, looking in, in the blood and in the adipose tissue. And if we look at the four carotenoid pigments that I found in these birds, lutein and zeaxanthin are more polar than beta-carotene and beta-cryptoxanthin. So it could be, and again, this is hypothesizing, but it could be that this more polar lutein was blocking the absorption of the other carotenoids. Um, and then as a female bird was running out of lutein, which was blocking, then she could allocate more of those other carotenoids to her later laid eggs. 
The allocation patterns that I found could also be adaptive due to differences in antioxidant function. So all these carotenoids do act as antioxidants to help combat that free radical production or that rapid metabolism that's occurring in the embryo and binding up these potentially damaging um, byproducts of that metabolism. Um, but they do vary in their antioxidant function. So those carotenoids that are less polar, like beta carotene, are more or less likely to bind up those free radicals or less likely to protect the embryo than a more polar carotenoid like lutein. So it could be that, again, that female bird is allocating the most of her best carotenoid lutein to number one, who's more likely to survive. And then as she's running out of that best carotenoid, she's compensating by allocating others. But again, a lot of what I find in my research is you open up more questions than you get answers. So I'm definitely going to follow up on a lot of these um, different questions that I have uh, in my following research years. OK, so now I'm going to move on and talk about another project that I worked on looking at the physical condition of a female bird, um, and then looking at how that affected her carotenoid allocation, and how both of these then affected her reproductive performance. So again, carotenoids are limited in nature. And so a female bird has to allocate carotenoids to three different things, which will lead to trade-offs. So she has to allocate carotenoids to her own self-maintenance. So she needs them for protection against uh, the antioxidant protection, as well as it enhances her immune system. Then, as we've talked quite a bit about, she needs to allocate carotenoids to her embryo in her egg yolk. And in a bird that's brightly colored, like the yellow-headed blackbird, she also has to allocate carotenoids to her sexual signals so that she can attract a, a, a male and have him then reproduce with her. So she has to trade off between these three things. And it's thought that a female bird that is in better health, so she's not requiring a lot of resources for her immune defense, so she's not fighting a disease, she's not in poor condition, then she can allocate more carotenoids to these less critical life history needs, such as reproduction and sexual signals. Because she can skip reproduction if she's not healthy, right? But she really does need to maintain her immune system. So then based on this trade-off and the results of some previous studies that have been done, I did predict that looking at these interactions between uh, female condition, uh, carotenoid reproduction, um, and sexual signals, I did ex expect to find that females in better condition would have more yolk and feather carotenoids, and those with higher levels of carotenoids would then have better reproductive success. OK, then just some field methods. So I nest searched five different wetlands in 2005, and again, I did this daily. Um, and I, if the, there was an egg present in the nest, so only if there was one or two eggs, what I would do is I would mark them with a non-toxic ink dot. And basically, it's a Sharpie marker, but it's a little bit more fun to say non-toxic ink dot. It makes a scientist feel better. Um, and I monitored 69 different nests then throughout the laying sequence, and I collected the third laid egg on the day it was laid. So here you can see a uh, three egg clutch, each of those marked within the laying sequence. So one egg got one dot, two egg, the second egg got two dots, and then that third laid egg that I collected got three dots, so that I knew which egg was which. Then what I did is I did go ahead and capture the female using the wire nest trap that you see here. So it actually just sits right over top the nest. The female comes back to incubator eggs, sees that there's a, kind of a, a barrier to her, and she searches around until she finds the funnel on the top. Very successful way of catching these birds. And then I removed the female from that trap as quickly as possible to reduce stress. And then I did take her mass and tarsus. Um, and the tarsus is uh, this lower leg bone. It's actually the fusion of the, the tarsals and metatarsals. Um, and then I collected a, a blood sample and three to five yellow feathers. Um, so here, it's a bit hard to see in this uh, kind of dim projector here, but you can actually do a lular um, bleeding from the wing. So you just make a small prick in a, a very prominent vein in the, in the wing, and then you take a small blood sample using hematocrit tube. So you can get a lot of information from the blood of a bird. And then to collect the feathers, I originally started plucking the feathers, but I got some really dirty looks from these birds. Um, so instead, then I started to take a little snip using a small scissors like you see here. Then what I did is I continued to visit the nest daily. So I wanted to determine reproductive success. I wanted to learn how many eggs were laid, how many of those eggs actually hatched, number of the chicks that fledged. And I did consider a chick to have fledged if they reached eight days old, because in this uh, study area, the females will start fledging at around seven to eight days, up to nine days old. So I wanted to make, to make sure to catch or catch, catch in my data set those birds that fledged a bit young. OK, so then in the laboratory, I did create a blood smear. And what I did with that is I identified 100 different white blood cells as either heterophils or lymphocytes. 
And basically what you can get from this is information about the stress that that bird is under. So the lower the heterophil lymphocyte ratio, the less stress that bird is, is basically, is she fighting an immune uh, response or fighting a disease? Um, is she stressed due to poor nutrition? And if she is stressed, then they do tend to have a, 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 a higher ratio here. Then the remaining blood sample that was still in that hematocrit tube was spun, and I got the proportion of red blood cells, and that gives you a good idea of just basic physiological condition of that bird. So if she's stressed due to, again, a lot of different factors, she'll have less red blood cells than a female that's in good health. Then for the feathers, I did wash them using a series of solvents. Uh, I removed the distal yellow portion like you see here because the basal part is actually quite brown. And then I extracted the carotenoids from those little parts of the yellow feather using acidified puridine, and then I quantified them using HPLC again. So you can see it's a very effective method for getting the carotenoids out of feathers. So you can see the before and after shot here. So here we're looking again at a chromatogram from the HPLC, and you can see that, again, we see these same four yellow carotenoid pigments that we saw in their egg yolks. And then looking at the concentration differences, so you can see here quite a bit different story than what we saw with the egg yolk in that the females are actually producing feathers with really high concentrations of lutein and lesser concentrations than of these other three carotenoids. And if you compare, lutein is making up about 67% of all the carotenoid pigments in the feathers. And kind of interesting, if we compare yellow-headed blackbirds with several other species here in North America, including the yellow warbler, the common yellowthroat, and the evening grosbeak, all of these species also use lutein almost exclusively to color their feathers. So yellowheads fall right in line with these others. So then to do the study where I was looking at the influence of maternal condition and carotenoids on reproduction, I did have body condition which is you can take the uh, mass and the tarsus length and get a mass corrected body mass using a regression line and the residuals. Then I had heterophil lymphocyte ratio, remember that was for stress, and then hematocrit getting an idea of the physiological status of that bird. Then for carotenoids, I had her third laid egg as well as her feathers, and then for reproduction, I had the egg mass of her third egg as well as the number of eggs that hatched, the number of chicks that fled, fledged, and then I also categorized birds as earlier or late breeders to see if the timing of breeding influenced any of these different parameters as well. Okay, so now on to some of the results that I found. Uh, here we're looking at the heterophil lymphocyte ratio, and remember the lower the ratio, the less stress that bird would be. So you can see here we're looking at beta carotene, and those birds that were more stressed tended to have less beta carotene in their yolks than females that were less stressed. Then, a, a bit confusing again with lutein here, in that female birds that were in better condition tended to have less lutein in their eggs than females that were in poor condition. So quite a puzzle. Then if we look at the, the concentration of carotenoids in their feathers and looking at the physiological condition of a bird looking at hematocrit, you can see that there was a positive relationship with hematocrit in that females that were in better condition produced feathers that were more yellow than females that were in poor, uh, poor condition. Okay, then looking at the data, looking at early and late breeders, uh, here we're looking at beta carotene between the two. The blue bars are the early breeders, the pink bars are the late breeders. And you can see that females that bred earlier in the season tended to have eggs that were higher, had higher concentrations of beta carotene. But again, a bit confusing, those birds that bred later tended to have higher concentration of lutein. Then comparing the physiological conditions that I measured of females, looking at hematocrit and heterophil lymphocyte ratio, you can see that female birds that bred uh, earlier tended to have a slightly higher hematocrit than those that bred later. And those birds that bred uh, earlier tended to have lower heterophil lymphocyte ratio than those that bred uh, later. Meaning, again, the lower heterophil lymphocyte ratio, meaning they were less stressed than those that bred later. Okay, so as I had predicted, so unlike the previous study I talked to you about, I actually did have some of my predictions come true. So females in better condition did have an increase in yolk and feather carotenoids. So here we're just looking again at two of the graphs I just explained to you. So uh, looking at beta carotene and heterophil lymphocyte ratio and hematocrit and feather carotenoids. Um, and then looking at that late and early breeding, uh, those that bred later tended to be in poor condition. Uh, they had a, a lower hematocrit, a higher heterophil lymphocyte ratio, and they tended to produce eggs that had lower yolk beta carotene. And some of the reasons why this could be, it could be that females that were in poor condition were actually delaying reproduction, waiting until later in the season, maybe waiting until food resources got better. Or it could be that these females that bred later were actually re-nesting. 
So yellow-headed blackbirds only typically produce one clutch a year, but if their nest does fail early in the breeding season, they will give it another go. And it could be that these birds were renesting, and if they're renesting, they have less energy to invest in that second clutch of eggs because they've already used up a lot of their carotenoids and other resources producing that first clutch. Okay, so then looking at lutein, again, I found it a bit confusing in that it was highest in eggs of later breeding females and females in poor condition. Um, it could, again, be due to differences in availability. So it could be that lutein simply is becoming more readily available later in the breeding season, and those birds that are breeding later are those that are more likely to be in poor condition. So it could just be a timing thing, insect emergence, or something about the diet of these birds that's changing a bit later in that breeding season. A bit surprising was the fact that I did not find any significant relationships between the carotenoids, the female condition parameters, and any of the, the reproductive parameters that I measured. So this could in part be due to the fact that a lot of the nests did fail. Only 38 of the nests that I monitored of those 69, so less than half, produced a fledgling. Um, and also, a lot of different things can play a role in defining reproductive success, so things like predation and weather conditions that are irrespective of the carotenoids and the condition of their mom that can play a role in defining this. So here is a nest that was flooded due to a, a major rain event in one of my wetlands. And this egg was destroyed by one of the main nest predators of the yellow-headed blackbird, and that is this little guy, the marsh wren. So a bit surprising, but these little guys, they go around and any unattended egg is destroyed on a wetland. So they'll actually go around waiting until a bird will leave its nest, and then they'll come and peck holes in those eggs. And this isn't true just for yellow-headed blackbirds, but for ducks and coots and anything else nesting on the same wetlands as these little guys. And what's thought is that these birds are trying to reduce competition for resources on that wetland by destroying any of the other offspring that would be produced there. So adorable little birds, they sing very pretty, but actually very bad for yellow-headed blackbirds. Okay, so I wanted to look in more detail at the role of carotenoids and female condition on reproduction of yellow-headed blackbirds. So I studied the growth and mass of nestlings in more detail because I was a bit surprised by finding no relationship uh, in that previous study. So female condition and carotenoid allocation has been shown to affect chick growth in several other species. So just for an example, in the female tree swallow, those that are in better condition tend to produce heavier nestlings than those that have artificially reduced condition. And what they do to reduce condition in the species is they remove some of the primaries so that it's a bit more difficult for them to go and find food. Again, to the blue tit, they've done a lot of research with these with the uh, carotenoid pigments in Europe, uh, and they found that Female birds that produce eggs with higher yolk carotenoids tended to have larger chicks than those that had lower concentration eggs. So then based on this, I had two predictions going into this project, looking in more detail at the growth and mass of these nestlings. I did predi predict that females in better condition would have larger and faster growing chicks, as well as females with higher yolk concentrations would have faster um, and larger and faster growing chicks. So you can see here, uh, this is the same chick looking at four-day increments, so you can see that they grow very rapidly. So this is a two-day-old nestling, uh, a six-day-old, and a 10-day-old. So that 10-day-old is actually a male, and he's about ready to fledge. He usually fledges at around 14 days. The males tend to stick around a little bit longer than their smaller siblings, smaller female siblings. Okay, so then looking at the field methods that I use, so nestlings were weighed daily using the spring scale that you see here. So you just basically take them out of the nest, put them in a little sack, and weigh them daily. And I did this for a total of 43 nests. And in order to determine who was who in the nest, I would take a Sharpie marker and draw on their tarsus. And it worked really well, but it had to be reapplied very, very often. And then in order to determine if they were male or female, I measured their tarsus at 8 to 10 days old. And then I only did include chicks that survived a seven-day-old in my analyses because prior to that, it's really hard to distinguish a male chick that's just not doing well from a female chick. And I wanted to determine sexual differences. Okay, so here we're looking at the data that I collected. This is for 72 different chicks. Uh, there were 29 males and 43 females. Uh, and as far as first and second, I didn't use third hatch chicks because they rarely survived. I had 42 first and 30 second hatch chicks. And the line on the bottom then is the females, and the line on the top is the males. So you can see that even while siblings are still in the nest together, there's already sexually, sexual dimorphism occurring. So the males are quite a bit larger than the females even at fledging or when they leave the nest. In order to determine the growth rate and to be able to compare across individuals, I did focus on the linear portion of that growth curve. So if we look back, there's kind of a linear portion right here that occurs at two to seven days old. 
So what I did is I looked at each of those, uh, that period for all of the individuals. I ran a regression line through it and took that slope of the regression line as an index to the linear growth rate of that individual. This is, again, just a summary slide that talks about the different parameters that I measured and included. So for the female, again, I had body condition, the mass of her third laid egg. I had her yolk carotenoids from that egg. Um, and then as far as nestling characteristics, I had the sex of that chick, as well as the position within the hatching sequence where they first or second. Then I had to use their mass at day six. And then I had their linear growth rate to use in the comparisons. OK, so here we're looking at the influence of the maternal body condition of the mother on the growth. Here we're looking at mass. And then here we're looking at the growth rate of male and female offspring. And you can see the males are in the white symbols. The females are in the yellow. And you can see that female chicks, uh, there was a positive correlation with the condition of their mom. And they tended to be larger if they came from a healthier mom. And they tended to grow faster as well as, well as their male siblings. Then if we look at the mass of the egg that they hatched from, there was a positive correlation for both male and females, female chicks, in their mass and their growth rates. So if you're from a bigger egg, you're off, you're off to a better start. Then if we look at beta carotene, one of the two carotenoids that I measured, you can see here that there was a positive correlation for both male and female chicks. And then looking at lutein, again, a bit confusing here in that for the males, there was a positive correlation with their mass and their growth rate. But for the females, there was actually a negative correlation. So that female chicks that hatched from larger or eggs with higher concentrations of lutein tended to be smaller than those that hatched from eggs with lower concentrations. OK, so one other interesting result of this uh, research project was that females in poor condition were more likely to fledge a daughter than a son. And this was for the first hatched chicks. And if you think about it in a sexually dimorphic species where the males are quite a bit larger than the females, those males are a lot more costly to raise. They're going to need a lot more food, a lot more energy than a female. So it could simply be that it was a lot easier for them to rear a female than a male chick. And in polygynous species where, remember, the male has to defend a territory, he has to acquire a harem to be successful at reproduction, whereas a female will reproduce every year regardless of her quality. Um, the female offspring are more likely to increase the lifetime reproductive success of, or fitness of the female, of their mother, than a male chick. Because if, if you're a male, you have to be a really sexy male to be able to be successful. OK, so then just to summarize the results I found from this research project, certainly some really interesting trends. I found that female condition and the allocation of carotenoid resources to eggs did have uh, carotenoid-specific effects. So remember, lutein and beta-carotene were different as well as there were different effects on the male and female offspring. And also, there were hatch order specific effects as well, being one uh, first hatch and second hatch being very different. And that was on both the mass and the growth rates of the nestlings. OK, so now just to summarize everything that I've told you about from my research in North Dakota, I just wanted to go through some of the highlights. So yellow-headed blackbirds have the, those four carotenoid pigments in their yolks. But remember, this is very different than what's been found in European species in that they have really high concentrations of beta-cryptoxanthin and beta-carotene. And all other European species have been found to have higher lutein and zeaxanthin. Most carotenoids increase across the laying sequence, with the exception of lutein. Female yellowheads have the same four carotenoid pigments in their feathers, but very interesting in that it's the exact opposite trend than what I found in their, in their yolks. So it could be that these are adaptive differences. And females in better condition have higher concentrations of yolk beta-carotene and feather carotenoids. Earlier breeding females, remember, are in better condition and have higher concentrations of yolk beta-carotene. Females in better condition produce larger daughters and faster growing sons. And females that laid larger eggs produce larger and faster growing daughters. And females with higher yolk concentrations of lutein produce smaller daughters and larger sons. OK, so I hope I pointed out a really blaring question here during my seminar. And it's a question that's been kind of driving me nuts and driving me forward in my research. And that is, what is up with lutein? So remember how it's very different than the other carotenoids that I studied was that it decreases across the laying sequence. It's highest in eggs of later breeding females and females in poor condition. And eggs with higher concentrations of lutein produce smaller female chicks but larger male chicks. Also something interesting that I didn't talk about previously because it wasn't statistically significant, but it's nearly so, is that females that fledged first hatched female chicks or daughters tended to have higher concentrations of yolk lutein. So kind of interesting that potentially a female is making a decision about allocating one carotenoid over another to her male offspring. But certainly that would require further research and supplemental feeding studies. 
So, and of course, it could be due to differences in availability between lutein and the other carotenoids. So something of interest when we look at the biosynthesis pathway in plants is that the other three carotenoids come from one branch of the biosynthetic pathway, whereas lutein comes from a completely different one. So it could simply, again, be found in different food resources that that female bird is e eating. But again, it requires a lot of future research, and I'm excited to tackle some of these questions that I've uncovered. Okay, so that leads me into my current research that I'm doing here in Alberta, um, and I've switched species. I've uh, moved on to the red-winged blackbird, um, and I did a study on the laying sequence trends, again, kind of comparing back to the yellowhead, and then looking at, currently looking at the effects of wetland restoration on the allocation of carotenoids to the yolks of, of yellow-headed blackbirds. Okay, so the red-winged, or of yellow, uh, red -winged blackbird. So the red-winged blackbird, unlike the yellow-headed blackbird, is fairly ubiquitous across North America. It's actually one of the most common songbirds. So all of you have probably seen one and heard one, and they can even become quite a nuisance in areas of North Dakota where they do a lot of uh, sunflower growing. Uh, but you can see here in Alberta, my study areas near Camrose, that there's fairly high concentrations of red-winged blackbirds, making them a great species to study here uh, compared to the yellowhead, which is much more rare here in Alberta than in North Dakota. The red-winged blackbird, uh, again, they're a large, fairly large passerin. They are sexually dimorphic, uh, mainly in coloration, not so much in size. The female is brown with white and, and brown striping on the breast and a little bit of orange coloration on the sides of her head, whereas the male is black overall with those flashy epaulets on his, on his wrists. So very distinctive birds. Um, they do nest in prairie wetlands, although they're a bit more generalist in their nesting requirements. They'll nest in shrubs, they'll nest in um, and other types of wetland vegetation, unlike the yellowhead that is almost exclusively using the cattails. They do build open cup nests, very similar to the yellowhead. The only way you can really tell the difference is to look at the nest lining. The yellowhead uses cattail to line the nest, whereas the redwing uses really fine grasses. They aren't as determinant in their laying as the yellowhead. They lay a clutch typically of two to five eggs, so there's a lot more variation. Although here in northern areas, they typically lay four eggs, so like the yellowhead. Okay, so here we're looking at the carotenoids. Uh, this is never, had never previously been done, so I needed to identify what was present. So you can see that the same four yellow carotenoids that I found in the yellow-headed blackbird were also present in the red wing. But this is a lot more busy, right, than the, the chromatogram I showed you of the yellowhead in that there's also two red carotenoids that I've been able to identify. And there's actually three other very prominent carotenoids that I'm still in the process of identifying. So, and you can see just on visual inspection, the yellow-headed blackbird egg looked very yellow, whereas the red-winged blackbird egg looks very dark orange, so very pretty egg yolks here. So in order to determine if there was laying sequence variation in the clutches of red-winged blackbirds, I did collect uh, 27 full clutches from eight wetlands in central Alberta, and this was done just recently in 2008. And I had a total of 82 eggs for this study. And based on the results of other studies, and in contrast to the yellowhead, um, I did expect that I'd find an interclutch decline, again, based on the fact that last hatched chicks in the red-winged blackbird rarely survive. So I did predict a female would allocate most to her, her best offspring. So here we're looking at the concentrations. Uh, something interesting to note is that these birds produce eggs with highest concentrations of lutein, similar to all of the other species that have previously been studied, including, well, with the exception of the yellowhead, but all the study species from uh, Europe. Um, and you can see that in this species, the first laid egg does have by far the highest concentration of most carotenoids. There's a few exceptions of lesser prominent carotenoids, but this would suggest that they're allocating the most to their first egg, unlike the yellowhead, which was allocating the most to their fourth laid egg. So here we're looking at some of the, the trends that I found. Again, remember that the eggs with the same letter designation were not statistically distinguishable. So these eggs were all different from one another using statistics. And we're looking at eggs one through five. Here we're looking at beta carotene, and here we're looking at lutein. So finally, these two carotenoids are agreeing. I just had to switch species to get this to happen. And you'd expect then that there is an interclutch decline, right? But wait, let's put in egg number four and five. Wow, this is kind of confusing. So it actually went up again so that the fourth laid egg was, had as high concentrations of carotenoids as number two. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have very many fifth laid eggs. I only had two because it's very rare that they lay these. Um, but it would certainly suggest there's still some increase if we look at later laid eggs as well. So kind of an interesting trend. And if we look at this trend, it is a unique trend that's never been reported in another bird species. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because this is a fairly recent uh, discovery, 
But I would suggest that the changes in female behavior and changes in her hormone, hormone profiles could be contributing to this trend. So what happens with the red-winged blackbird is she begins incubating after laying her third laid egg. So because she's sitting tight on her nest and changing her behavior from out foraging, gathering resources for egg production, there is a corresponding change in her hormones. And hormones do play a very important role in determining the circulating levels of carotenoids in the system of a female bird. So it could be due to just changes in her behavior, changes in hormones that are causing this increase from egg three to four. But it could also be adaptive um, and definitely requires some further research. Maybe she knows number four has the least chance of surviving in the nest because he's gonna hatch one to two days later than one, two, and three. And so maybe she's allocating more energy or more resources to that to that offspring. And I should say, it's not like she's making a conscious decision, but it's a, uh, an adaptive, adapt, adaptive decision that she's making to allocate these resources to her offspring. Okay, so then I also am doing a study comparing natural and restored wetlands to determine if wetland restoration projects are actually producing high quality breeding sites for birds here in Alberta. And I've worked very closely with Ducks Unlimited in this project. And I've used um, 11 wetlands, actually I have uh, more from 2009, but this is data from 2008. And I've collected 109 eggs. Uh, four of the wetlands were recently restored, so restored within the last six years. Four of my wetlands were greater than six years and three were natural or, or never drained. And here are some of the really cool results that I've been finding in that here we're looking at beta carotene and lutein, and I'm actually finding that those birds that breed on recently restored wetlands tend to have lower concentrations of carotenoids than those that are breeding on uh, those that have been in restoration longer, and certainly in natural sites. So it would suggest that restoration is a really good thing, but it's gonna take a little bit more time for them to restore to a level where there'll be good breeding sites for birds, at least for the blackbirds I study. I'm also collecting information on breeding birds on these wetlands as well as aquatic insects using emerging uh, aquatic insects, insect traps like the one you see here to get a better idea of what resources are available to those birds and what birds are using the wetlands as well as we're collecting uh, water samples to look at differences in the water chemistry to get a better idea of the comparison uh, of these species. And one of the favorite foods of both species of blackbirds are these little blue, blue damselflies um, and you can find the birds carrying around uh, five or 10 of them in their bill, bringing them back to their offspring. So very common food source so there for the birds. So looking at differences in the abundance of food can give a good idea of the reproduction we can expect on these wetlands. Okay, with that, I'm gonna wrap up the seminar by acknowledging all the people and, and funding sources that have contributed, all of my co-authors, as well as my field and laboratory assistants. I've had lots of undergraduates helping me out. All of this research was uh, conducted on private land, so I have to thank all of the landowners. I had help with the HPLC method development as well as funding sources here uh, in Alberta as well as in North Dakota. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions.